Plantain and a banana tree is technically not a tree. Technically, it is an herb. Plantain and banana trees, in quotes, are rhizomes, which means that they spring up from a series of shoots that come up from the ground. And over time, those shoots will just continue to come up and sprout new trees. And so it's not sort of a traditional kind of cultivation, right, where there's a seed. Rhizomes just sort of keep regenerating. A plantain tree or a banana tree is incredibly resilient as a plant and is likely to withstand a hurricane. And if a grove of plantain or bananas is decimated by a storm, they'll pop right up. This is Von Diaz, an American writer who wrote Coconuts and Collards, a cookbook about Puerto Rican cuisine. She's also currently writing a book called Isolas, which explores how ingredients connect warm weather islands across the globe. The other thing that I think is incredibly resilient about plantains and bananas is that they produce a lot of fruit, particularly in tropical environments. I'm Clarissa Way, and you're listening to Climate Cuisine, a podcast that explores how sustainable ingredients are grown and prepared in similar climate zones around the world. Now, in the hands of different cultures, one ingredient can take on so many wondrous forms. And as the world faces dramatic upward shifts in our base temperature, climate-centric discussions on crops will become increasingly important to the resiliency of our food systems. This episode is all about bananas and plantains. And it's also about the dark consequences of growing a relatively sustainable plant in an unsustainable way and only selling one variety. But first of all, what's the difference between a banana and a plantain? A plantain is actually just a type of banana, but they tend to be slightly larger than bananas with a much thicker skin. The main difference is that plantains are starchier and are used to make savory dishes. When they're bright green, they have a certain flavor, they're prepared a certain way. Those might just be deep fried or green plantains are very starchy. So you can actually grate them and form them into a dumpling and boil them. Right, and like without adding like flour or any other additives. So why have I chosen this plant? In California where I grew up, the banana is really just a fruit. You eat it alone or pop it into a smoothie and that's all there is to it really. But did you know that almost all bananas in our grocery stores are one variety called Cavendish and they have the exact same flavor. But when I moved to Taiwan, I realized and began to notice that there's actually so many different types of bananas out there. Right now in my garden, I'm growing three different types. A normal yellow one similar to a Cavendish, a vibrant red one which tastes like a custard, and a tiny banana that's only a couple inches long and much sweeter than grocery store varieties. They haven't produced fruit just yet. But less than a year, they've gone from being tiny seedlings to giant, enormous trees. So how do I grow them exactly? In my garden, I have arranged them in a semi-circle in the corner. And because they can absorb and take in so much water, I've dug a pit in front of them and that's where I pile up all my weed trimmings and compost. Bananas are natural recycling machines and can take in a massive amount of nutrients and water. And whenever there's a storm, they can take a really serious beating and still survive. They're one of the hardiest plants I've ever encountered, and it's no wonder why it's such a staple in tropical places across the world. Because they just, again, they just spring up right out of the ground. They produce all this fruit. The fruit matures relatively quickly. And then you can eat it at literally every stage of maturation. And I believe that's, you know, one of many reasons, in addition to it being actually, like, tasty in all of those stages, that it's so ubiquitous in Puerto Rican cooking. But if there are so many different types of bananas out there, why do most Americans only get one choice at the grocery store? To find out, I spoke to Rob Dunn, a biologist who wrote a book called Never Out of Season, how having the food we want when we want it threatens our food supply and our future. In his book, he uses the story of the banana as a microcosm for the industrial food system at large. I think generally we have a tendency as humans to imagine ourselves mostly to be in control. And I'm fascinated with this concept in general. 
monocultures and industrial agriculture are, are one particularly conspicuous version of the problems that arise when we imagine that we're fully in control and that nature doesn't have any agency in the story. The more I dug into the story of industrial agriculture and, and where we are today in terms of our food systems, the more amazing the hubris associated with the ways in which we farm was to me. And so I became fascinated with thinking about how did we get to this situation? But also, what do we know about the precarity of the situation? What do we know about the ways in which our belief in our own power to control nature put us at risk? And so I just started digging into this story. And the more and more that I did, the more I realized that more broadly, we tend to not talk about the natural history and the ecology and the evolution of our food systems and the reality that they still have this interplay with the rest of nature. And it seemed to me that this was something that people in general didn't think about very much. Every day you go to the store, wherever you get your food, that in the field in which it grows, it's constantly interacting with other species in really complex ways. And one of those that I was recently reminded of relates to the International Space Station. And so in the International Space Station, there are crops, and you can't see me, but I'm doing air quotes around crops because they don't provide sustenance to anybody, but they're kind of experiments in growing green things on the space station. And it was recognized about a decade ago and has become much clearer recently that the crops on the space station have crop pathogens. And so even in this super isolated place where you can't open the door, you can't open the window, and you have just extraordinary control over what goes up there, that we can't keep those crop fields in isolation. That to me was a remarkable reality. And then you think back to the global agricultural system, well, we have basically whole continents of individual crops. And so if we can't control the interactions between our crops and other species on the space station, why do we think we can do it at the scale of a continent? And yet we do. And yet our food depends on this belief every day. It kept waking me up. And so I just, I wanted to explore this story more. And I happened to be at a university where lots of people you know, work on the future of crops. And so I had these people around me that I could talk to and use to help think about this, this question. And where does the banana come into play for all of this? The story of the banana features this really almost unbelievable collapse of an agricultural system due to monoculture. And in addition to that collapse, it features the response to that collapse, which is to do the same exact thing again. The banana story is one of these stories where not only does it show our risk, but it shows how we respond to that risk, which is to just keep doing what we've done and to hope that we're clever enough, to hope that we breed new crops fast enough, to hope that we can respond. In that way, the banana story really was this allegory for our broader agricultural systems. So if you think back to the 1800s, say, in their native range, the many, many banana varieties and species that were available had many different flavors as a function of how hard they were, which aromas they had, which taste molecules they had. They could be savory, they could be sweet, they could have a hint of vanilla, and it was this beautiful richness. And so the first thing that happens in the banana flavor story is that one clone of one variety of one species of banana becomes the main banana that's planted worldwide. And this happens in the early 1900s. The Gros Michel is the banana, and it was a clone called Big Mike. And so that variety already changed the flavor landscape of bananas in that it was just one. People describe it as being enjoyable and having a nice aroma, but it, there was no variation whatsoever. No two bananas that you would choose would taste different unless one was rotten. That was the only variety you got. That's when the Cavendish banana, the variety you find in grocery stores across America today, was introduced. The third shift in flavor is that Panama disease wiped out the Grosch Michel banana. And so what replaced it was a banana that looked like it and was the same size and could be packaged in the same packaging. It's a very simple banana aroma and a very simple banana flavor. And that's really just a couple of molecules, you know, hitting your olfactory receptors. By all accounts, doesn't really have the same flavor because we buy bananas without sampling them. And for the flavor of the Roche Michel to disappear without people really realizing it. 
In the big sweep, you go from this natural master work of banana diversity and flavors and all of it to one banana that's nonetheless quite flavorful to another banana that by most accounts is less flavorful. And that's the banana experience you can have everywhere. And so it's kind of a McDonald'sization of bananas. And so when we plant those varieties, we essentially shift all of the future planning under the cleverness of just a handful of scientists that we hope when things go wrong, that they can work fast enough to find a solution and that they can mobilize. But it seems ill-advised to depend on these scientists to just be ready and to just do this each time we have a tragedy. And like COVID, there's no money to solve the problem or there's much less money to solve the problem before there's a tragedy. And what's much more sensible is that even if we're going to have some dependence on monoculture, and we're going to need to one way or another, to also have a focus on understanding these varieties we do have so that we have these varieties at the ready when we have a problem, that we have these other bananas, that we have these other choices, and that we know which of those choices are resistant to particular pathogens or pests, that we have this portfolio that helps us to respond to these problems each time they occur. Both the Gros Michel and Cavendish were specifically bred so that they can be transported across oceans without spoiling. But this obsession with the perfect banana has also caused a lot of bloodshed. In the early 20th century, bananas were hyped up as an exotic and cheap fruit from abroad and became immensely popular in the American and European market. Banana companies like United Fruit, an American corporation, took over entire countries like Guatemala, Colombia, and Honduras, who became economically dependent on the Gros Michel as their sole export product. Now, to keep banana prices low, the CIA actually hired military militia to suppress politicians and farmers who fought back to take back their land. In 1928, there was even an incident called the Banana Massacre, where workers of the United Fruit Company were killed for demanding dignified working conditions. The exact number of deaths have never been confirmed, but it's anywhere from 47 to 2,000 people who died. None of this would have happened if there wasn't such a high fixation and demand for the bananas in America, a fruit that isn't even adapted to most of the country's climate. The Panama disease eventually ended up wiping out the Gros Michel, only to be replaced by the more resilient Cavendish, which is now actually being ravaged by the same disease. In short, bananas can be sustainable, but only in the right context. Places like India have been enjoying the banana for centuries without much issue, and unlike in America, they have a cornucopia of varieties to choose from. I am married into a family which belongs to Kanyakumari or the Nagar Koil town, which is the southernmost part of India. And here is one place where there are at least 10 to 12 varieties of the banana of various colors, shapes and sizes. I met this particular banana farmer. He's from a village called Parasala, which is very nearby to my in-laws place. He grows close to around 350 plus varieties of banana. This is Manakshi, a freelance writer from India who wrote a piece for the BBC in 2020 on why bananas are considered sacred in India. And in an ironic twist, Manakshi isn't the biggest fan of bananas. I love the plantain, but I did not love the fruit. We also chop them into slices and then fry them in oil and then make chips out of them as a snack. So that's all fine. But then I just can't consume the banana as a fruit. Wait, so why did you write an article about bananas? Because of my hate for the banana. So I thought, why not, you know, (laughs) channel it in a positive way. Often associated with fertility and bounty, she wrote that the banana is often placed on the side or entrance to a home during weddings and religious festivals. Like there is a temple town and this temple town's name is Parani. So here they make a particular offering which is known as Prasad. They use a particular variety of the banana which is known as Virupachi. It's a banana variety. And I just spoke with one of the priests over there as to why they make only with this particular variety of banana. And I got to know that this particular variety has very less of water content. 
okay so it doesn't get spoiled easily they smash the banana then add honey into it and then curd into it so it's a mixture of a lot of other ingredients it's known as panchamrutam panch is five so it's a nectar which is made of five ingredients and one of the ingredients is the banana that itself was quite fascinating for me as to there was so much of thought which went into even the preparation of a simple thing like a divine offering for example there are devotees who actually travel for a long time for many days and take it back home to their family members so they have made sure that this particular variety of banana has less water content so that it doesn't get spoiled easily some cuisines in the world revolve around the starchy varieties of bananas aka plantains plantains is really considered like the ingredient of the island it's like a dominican symbol similar to like the dominican flag This is Vanessa Mota, a food writer behind the blog My Dominican Kitchen. And on her blog, she has pages upon pages of recipes dedicated to the plantain. She fries them, mashes them, and also deep fries them. A lot of my audience are like Dominican people abroad, right? Like people from the diaspora that are looking to still create the dishes that they used to eat in the island or that their grandmothers and families used to make for them, but they don't necessarily know how to make it with ingredients cuz You know, growing up with our grandmothers, we learn how to cook in a way that is not really with measures. It's like a little bit of this, a little bit of that. And if you call them, you ask them, "How do I make this dish?" They're going to tell you exactly like that. Like you add a little bit of this, a little bit of that, but you don't really know what a little bit is, right? It's just one of those things that identify a Dominican, you know, our love for plantains and green plantains and just the popularity of how widely available it is and how much is cooked throughout the island in the households. I think, you know, Dominican people can eat plantains every day in any of their dishes, either for breakfast, lunch, or dinner. I don't know what Dominican household that doesn't eat plantains every day. I think that's really what was very unique to us. One of the most popular dishes in the Dominican Republic is mangu, which is mashed plantains, and the way that we prepare it is simply by boiling the plantains, the green plantains. with some salt and then once they are tender you mash them with a little bit of water and butter to make it really smooth that's what we call mangu and it's usually served with fried dominican salami and fried eggs and fried cheese which is called los tres golpes the three hits so <laughs> it's a great dish it's very filling and usually it's eaten for breakfast you know for people to have like a good meal at the beginning of the day and it's just really popular and delicious. So with that we cook the same way. Sometimes we boil it and mash it, sometimes we fry it for a dish called mango maduros, which is sweet fried plantains. You can make it a dessert, so you can cook them on a skillet with a little bit of sugar to make like a caramel and cinnamon, and that usually tastes really good as well. In fact, some cultures are actually so dependent on the banana that it's one of the only starches that they eat. One of the interesting things I should mention here is that the Jain community in India, so Jains do not eat any tubers that grow under the ground. So they have a lot of dietary restrictions which have to do with their religious beliefs which is that they don't want to harm any living beings. I'm Vidya Balachandar. I'm a food writer and editor. I am presently the editor of Whetstone South Asia. Pav bhaji which is a very very popular street food from the western part of India especially from Bombay. Usually the base is made of tomatoes and potatoes and the potato adds the bulk and the flavor and that starchy kind of lushness. But because the Jains cannot use potatoes, they sub it with plantains. The substitute works really well because I think the flavor of plantain is quite mild, like especially when you peel it and cook it. It's not like it would stand out, you know. It's not like it would call attention to itself, which makes it such a great companion for dishes that need that thickening, that need the goodness of, let's say, potatoes. But you know, if a community can't use it, they naturally veer towards plantains. There are so many instances of plantains being used in this way in different parts of the country. Of course, there's a staggering variety of bananas that you can just eat, but I think it's always had a place in cooking. Always. 
Several South Indian communities use it to make sweet dishes that have a savory touch. Some of them use it for outright savory dishes. So I think that just as there's such a huge variety of bananas available, there's also an equally large number of uses for it. And it's not just the fruit that can be used for cooking. The leaves are really useful as well. Using the banana leaf is actually very common in South Asia as well, in that it's very commonly used in South Indian weddings as a disposable kind of plate almost. In 2014, she wrote an article for Roads and Kingdoms about a dish called lamprias, savory rice and meat wrapped in a banana leaf. It's a dish from Sri Lanka, where her husband is from. This particular dish, which is delicious and is considered a delicacy because it is involved and time-consuming and has several different elements, but it's also deeply representative of the Dutch burger community, is a minority community and rapidly shrinking in Sri Lanka. The Dutch burgers are an ethnic group in Sri Lanka of mixed Dutch, Portuguese and Sri Lankan descent. And this dish was invented by them. Their cuisine I found so interesting because I think it combines strands of Indonesian influence with some Dutch influence, a lot of Sri Lankan and South Asian influence, and all wrapped together in this kind of banana leaf which grows abundantly in tropical places, especially in Sri Lanka. It's very common to see backyards with banana trees and, you know, banana blossoms, seeing ripe bananas. So I felt like it was a great story about how maritime trade and history and communities and colonialism all came together in this one really neatly wrapped up package. All throughout South Asia, the banana is also used as a plate. Typically, a South Indian wedding meal would include several components. And way before plates and buffets and other things, the people must have just found it easier to use something that was readily available. So typically at a wedding, you're always given a little bit of water when you start just to wet the leaf. And then you kind of remove whatever surface layer of dust or whatever might be there. And then they begin to serve things on the platter. So the banana leaf as a platter has a long history in South Asia. It's quite commonly used in this way of wrapping things in it, just mainly, I think, to serve as a seal and to, if you want to steam something, it's a great way to do that. There are communities in South Asia who use it to steam fish. For instance, the Parsi community, which is a very small community based in Western India, they coat pieces of fish in green chutney and then they would wrap it in banana leaves and then steam it. So it keeps the fish really moist and it also serves as a very neat way to do this without having to use too many utensils. You just get these little parcels that are already kind of neatly rolled up with a toothpick in the middle that you can just remove and eat straight out of. So, you know, it's been used as a platter, it's been used as a receptacle. It also lends this kind of aroma. See, there are so many components. There are five or six components that go into this rice dish. And like in Puerto Rico, the Dominica Republic, and South India, plantains are a really big part of the diet in Sri Lanka. There is a green kind of plantain that's commonly used in Sri Lanka. It's called the ash plantain. It's actually quite starchy. And one of the best ways in which I've eaten it is when it's thinly sliced, deep fried, and then thrown together with some onions and tomatoes and vinegar and chilies and made into an almost like a pickle that kind of goes with your meal. And for me, that was a revelation of flavor because there's obviously the crispness of the plantains and the fact that they have that beautiful starchiness. But given this completely different novel treatment, you know, and it was so savory and just so delicious, I'm sure I just could not get enough of it. It's very common in Tamil households to make a kind of mash out of plantains. And it's a savory mash and it's cooked. So, of course, one of the popular renditions of it is made with potatoes. But, you know, the plantains also have a similar starchiness, which I find that so many communities really thrive on in South Asia. After hearing about all of these wonderful ways that all the different varieties of bananas are eaten and cooked around the world, I had to ask, how can we change our food system so that our grocery aisles might one day be a little bit more colorful and diverse than it is today? For Rob, his tip is to be on the lookout for flavor. 
the truth is, if you search out flavor in your foods, often you're searching out varieties that aren't the main industrialized varieties. When we select, when we engineer these new varieties, very rarely is flavor the thing we're choosing. Most of the time, we're choosing the things that grow fastest, the things that are easiest to harvest. And often, flavor is sort of left behind. But one thing that people can for sure do is to figure out how to support their local farmers and to engage with local farmers to buy a diversity of varieties from those farmers. And so, you know, I live in North Carolina. At the moment, we don't grow bananas, although in future climates will probably be a banana-y place. But there are lots of crops that do grow here. And so finding local farmers at farmers markets or other places that those local farmers sell and buying a diversity of varieties from those farmers and figuring out which of those have flavors you don't know about, which of those have other features that are surprising. And so I think there can be a fun kind of engagement there where you're exploring new flavors and you're providing a way to incentivize those farmers to keep those flavors and those varieties growing. Because for farmers, there's also a trade-off here, which is that the more diversity you have in your field, often the harder it is to use large-scale tools and systems to manage those varieties. And then I think also just becoming aware of where these foods you're eating come from. And when you can, eating in season, eating things that are local, the challenging reality is a lot of the decisions are policy decisions. And so research who you're voting for, research their policies on agriculture and agricultural futures. It's one of these answers that's never fully satisfying and yet It's extraordinarily important to what the future of our foods look like with regard to wonderful things like flavor or scary things like the collapse of the system. A thank you to the Climate Cuisine team, co-producer and audio editor Kat Hong, researcher Olivia Maeda, production assistant Xin Yun, and intern Indio Clarkson. I'd also like to thank Whetstone founder Stephen Satterfield, Whetstone Radio Collective executive producer Celine Glazier, Sound engineer Max Katolchak, associate producer Quentin LeBeau, and sound intern Simon Lavender. You can learn more about this podcast at whetstoneradio.com, on Instagram and Twitter at Whetstone Radio, and subscribe to our YouTube channel, Whetstone Radio Collective, for more podcast video content. And you can learn more about all things happening at Whetstone at whetstonemedia.com.